Okay, well, we're right at 11 o'clock Eastern, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Lauren Menger Ogle, and I am a co-chair of the Nora Services Sector Council. Uh, and Mike, I'll let you briefly introduce yourself. I'm Mike Foley, I'm the other co-chair of the uh, Services Sector Council, and I am an economist with the SHARP program at the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries. Great, thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, so we are excited to announce the release of a new document today, Protecting Temporary Workers' Best Practices for Host Employers. Um, there's many different types of temporary workers. This document is related to protecting temporary staffing agency workers, which are those who are paid by a staffing company and assigned to a host, work for a host employer. Um, and this includes workers who are on both short and long-term assignments. So as the title of the document suggests, the best practices included in this document are intended for host employers of temporary workers. The document was developed by the Nora Services Sector Council Contingent Workers Workgroup in partnership with NIOSH, the American Society of Safety Professionals or ASSP, the American Staffing Association and the SHARP program within Washington State's Department of Labor and Industries. So before we introduce you to this new document, we want to provide a brief overview of NORA as well as a brief history on how this document came to be. So NORA, the National Occupational Research Agenda, is a partnership program that is stewarded or coordinated by NIOSH that aims to stimulate innovative research and improved workplace safety and health practices. We're currently in the third decade of NORA, which started in 2016. NORA consists of 10 industry sectors, which are based on the main areas of the US economy, and seven safety and health cross sectors, which are organized according to the major safety and health issues affecting the US working population. So each sector and cross sector has a council that is responsible for developing and maintaining a research agenda. The agendas are meant to set broad research objectives for the nation by identifying the knowledge and actions that are most urgently needed to prevent avoidable adverse workplace safety and health outcomes related to each sector and cross sector. And so the collection of these 17 agendas comprises the occupational safety and health research agenda for the nation. Okay. NORA councils are a national venue for individuals and organizations with common interests in occupational safety and health to come together. Councils first aim to develop a research and maintain a research agenda for the nation, as I already mentioned. And then once these agendas are in place, each council works to advance the objectives set forth in their agenda through information sharing, partnerships and enhancing the dissemination and implementation of evidence-based practices. And the ultimate goal of the NORA councils is to promote the widespread adoption of improved workplace safety and health practices. The NORA services sector is the largest of the 10 industry sectors with over 72 million U.S. workers distributed across 11 major North American Industry Classification System, or NAICS industry groups. It is very, very broad, very diverse sector. It ranges from teachers to hotel housekeepers, movie producers to librarians, bank tellers to restaurant cooks, and janitors to landscaping and tree care workers, among many other occupations. The Nora Services Sector Council currently has over 50 members. And this slide shows you a screenshot of the council website, which includes links to the research agenda for services, as well as a list of our council members. The website uh, homepage also includes a link to the document that we're discussing today in this webinar. 
So the research agenda for the services sector, which was finalized and published in May of 2018, includes five main objectives. The first is to reduce the incidence and severity of traumatic injuries within the services sector. The second is to develop, test, and disseminate intervention programs to prevent and reduce musculoskeletal disorders. The third is to reduce injuries and illnesses among contingent workers. The fourth is to reduce the incidence of chronic disease. And then the fifth is to reduce hearing loss in the sector. So in an effort to advance the objectives set forth in the agenda for services, the council has two active work groups focused on high risk working populations. We have one work group focused on landscaping and tree care workers, the landscaping safety work group. And then we have another group focused on contingent workers, which is the contingent workers work group. So the document we'll be sharing with you today is a product of the contingent workers work group. The goal of this work group is to raise awareness about safety and health hazards and protective factors for temporary agency workers. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there's many different types of contingent or temporary workers, such as gig workers, contract workers, and seasonal or part-time workers. Uh, the contingent workers work group of the council is specifically focused on temporary agency workers, which again are those who are employed by a staffing company to work on the site of a host employer company. The contingent workers work group has about 30 members, including representatives from staffing companies, host employers and worker organizations, among others, and this really allows for diverse and inclusive viewpoints on how to best protect and promote the safety and health of temporary workers. Research looking at workers' compensation claims suggests temporary agency workers may be at an increased risk for being injured on the job. So the graph on this slide shows data from a study conducted in Washington State. It was actually conducted by Mike Foley, our council co-chair, in which you can see the, uh, although it's very small um, print and you probably can't see the details, the black bars indicate the claim rates for temporary workers uh, whereas the gray bars indicate the claim rates for um, non-temporary or permanent workers. And you can see that the rates for temporary workers were higher than those for non-temporary workers across almost all of the risk classification categories that were examined. There's a number of factors that may contribute to increased risk of injuries for temporary workers. Um, first of all, they are often assigned to more hazardous jobs. They're also typically younger and less experienced and more frequently new to the job, and therefore they may lack familiarity with work operations, associated hazards, and protective practices. Also, because of the precarity of their work arrangement, temporary workers may feel um, not comfortable speaking up about safety and health concerns or reporting injuries um, out of a fear of losing their job or other negative repercussions. And then finally, given that temporary workers have two employers, a staffing company and a host employer, there may be some confusion as, as to which employer is responsible for different aspects of safety and health. So the Contingent Workers Work Group has set out to conduct a series of three awareness raising campaigns focusing on host employers, staffing companies, and temporary workers. The work group decided to start with a, a campaign focused on host employers because they control and supervise the work of temporary workers, and therefore they may have the greatest ability to protect their safety and health. In conducting these awareness raising campaigns, the Contingent Workers Work Group aims to build from and expand on the guidance issued through the OSHA Temporary Worker Initiative, which was launched in 2013 in response to the high rates of injuries among temporary workers. The OSHA Temporary Worker Initiative has issued a series of guidance documents and bulletins pertaining to the joint safety and health responsibilities of staffing companies and host employers. Taking this guidance into consideration, the Contingent Workers Work Group identified a need for a more in-depth set of best practices for host employers to follow to ensure that they're going beyond compliance to protect the safety and health of temporary workers, which leads us to the document that we are excited to introduce you to today. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Mike and he's going to uh, introduce you to the document. Oh, thanks, Lauren. Um, just before I begin, I'd like you to make to be aware that the, a link to the document that I'm going to be talking about was put in the chat. So if you just went there and clicked on that, it'll take you right to the to the document itself for you to download. Um, so this is the document. This is the cover page of the document. And I just wanted to just um, begin by taking you through some of the how this document was brought together and and um, and all of the um, groups that that had input into this. So the initial draft of protecting temporary workers best practices for host employers was created based on OSHA TWI guidance documents and bulletins, uh, temporary worker initiative uh, guidance documents, um, resources developed by the National Safety Council and Business and Legal Resources, or BLR, and the knowledge and ex expertise of the work of the contingent work group work members. The contingent workers work group solicited feedback on the initial draft from host employers and others, and modifications were made based on the feedback we received. The co-branding partners, including the American Staffing Association, the American Society of Safety Professionals, and the Sharp Research Program within Washington State's Department of Labor and Industries also provided feedback, which was incorporated into the final draft. This document is intended to apply to host employers across all industries who employ or are planning to employ temporary workers at their work sites. We wanted to note a few um, just important disclaimers at the beginning of the document. First, this is considered a general set of best practices and is not meant to replace the formal elements of an OSH program or their or legal requirements. Second, these best practices may need to be modified based on the specific facts of each case. For instance, when a host employer is contracting with multiple staffing companies or the rare cases in which the staffing company is the supervising employer. And third, laws can vary across the states with, with OSHA approved state plans. So it's also important to check state specific OSHA laws. Uh, next slide. Lauren, uh, can you advance the slide? Thank you. So in this document, the recommended practices are organized into three sections, which are represented in clockwise order beginning from the top in this Venn diagram. First, evaluating and addressing workplace safety and health in a written contract. Second, training uh, for temporary workers and their worksite supervisors. And third, injury and illness reporting, response, and record keeping. By following these best practices and going beyond compliance with OSHA laws and regulations, host employers can do their part to ensure a safer and healthier workplace. Each of these three sections, um, and could you click, Lauren? Yeah, each of these three sections includes a set of best practices followed by a scenario which presents a situation or problem faced by a host employer and then a summary of recommended steps the host employer should take in order to provide an example of how these best practices might be implemented. There are also checklists uh, back, yeah. There are also checklists related to each of the three main sections of the document that can be printed or completed electronically. And these are included in the appendix to the document. And then finally, at the end of the document, We've included links to additional resources, such as the OSHA Temporary Worker Initiative Bulletins and the ANSI Z10 Guidance Manual, which outlines a proven approach to managing safety and health risks with resources, with tools, and practical examples tailored to the needs of smaller organizations. Now, we're going to go through and give you just a sample of the content that's included in each of those three sections of that diagram, in the, in the three sections of the document. Um, starting with evaluation and contracting. In, in terms of evaluation, uh, prior to writing and signing a written contract, host employers and staffing companies should evaluate all facets of safety and health related to each organization and the jobs that temporary and the jobs that temporary workers are being hired to perform. As part of this process, host employers should first review all the job tasks job hazard analyses, equipment, and or machinery 
and the work sites to which temporary workers might foreseeably be sent with the staffing company in order to identify together potential hazards and the necessary protections, training, and PPE required for each temporary worker. Secondly, provide the staffing company with requested safety data and other information that will allow them to evaluate the safety of the work site. And third, invite a staffing, invite a representative from the staffing company to visit the work site or work sites to conduct a walkthrough to assess the safety conditions. And finally, ensure the staffing company has a commitment to safety, including a process in place to evaluate job candidates for the necessary qualifications and or experience they must have relevant to the tasks being performed. And then moving now to the contract itself, the division of responsibilities for safety and health between the staffing company and the host employer should be reviewed regularly and set forth in a written contract to encourage, to encourage proper implementation and accountability for all pertinent safety and health protections. The written contract should clearly specify pertinent job details, including approved tasks and necessary worker qualifications and or experience, required PPE, and the training each employer will provide. Second, communication and documentation responsibilities for both employers pertaining to ongoing risk assessment, changes to job tasks or hazards, and training. Injury and illness reporting, response, and record-keeping responsibilities of both employers, about which we'll talk more later. And finally, other aspects of workplace safety and health, such as which employer is responsible for providing direct supervision of the temporary workers and responsibilities related to medical surveillance and screening when necessary. Uh, uh, could you advance the slide? Thanks. So moving to the training for temporary workers and the worksite supervisors section. According to OSHA, in most cases, the host employer is responsible for providing site and task specific safety and health training. And the staffing company is responsible for providing general safety and health awareness training. Site and task specific safety and health training should be provided for all temporary workers on new assignments or new jobs tasks on existing assignments. And they should be, and this should be identical or equivalent to the training provided to permanent employees doing the same or similar work. The document covers in um, yeah, the document covers in detail the topics to be included in site and task specific training for temporary workers, such as approved tasks, how to re recognize, reduce, and control site and task specific hazards, required PPE, and who will pay for, supply, and, and provide training on it, as well as fit testing if needed. OSHA laws related to workplace safety and health, emphasizing that temporary workers have the same rights and responsibilities as non-temporary workers, first aid and emergency procedures, and finally, procedures for reporting safety and health concerns, injuries, illnesses, and close calls, as well as what to expect after reporting. Uh, turning to some other training recommendations, um, we should, and it's important to make sure workers have complete knowledge a complete knowledge assessment after training to ensure that their understanding of key concepts and, re and to retrain them if necessary. Excuse me. Um, re review the general safety and health awareness training provided by the staffing company to determine ad adequacy. And third, it's important to train supervisors of temporary workers regarding the tasks that workers are approved to perform as well as those they are not approved to perform and procedures for changing job tasks, emphasizing that the host employer should receive written approval of the changed tasks from the staffing company, and the temporary workers should receive any additional training and PPE needed before the new tasks are undertaken. Second, their responsibility to provide temporary workers with the same supervision provided to non-temporary workers doing the same or similar work as well as the potential need to provide extra mentoring and supervision to new temporary workers who may be inexperienced with the assigned tasks and unfamiliar with the work site. The joint responsibilities of the staffing company and the host employer as detailed in the written contract and also 
finally, to how to effectively communicate with temporary workers and make them feel comfortable speaking up about ocean, about occupational safety and health incidents or concerns. And now, now turning to that third section, injury and illness reporting, response, and record keeping. It's important, um, sorry, effective injury and illness reporting, response, and record keeping are vital to prevention of future incidents. With regards to reporting of, in, of temporary worker injuries and illnesses, host employers should first inform the staffing company immediately after an injury occurs. And secondly, report fatalities and required injuries to OSHA. With regards to responding to temporary worker injuries and illnesses, host employers should first conduct joint incident in investigations with the staffing company and affected workers and implement preventive measures and secondly, ensure temporary workers and their supervisors are aware of procedures for accessing medical treatment and returning to work following an injury if applicable. And then finally, with regards to record keeping um, of temporary worker injuries and illnesses, host employers should record temporary worker illnesses and injuries on their OSHA 300 log. OSHA requires that injury and illnesses illness records be kept by the employer who is providing the day-to-day -day supervision and controlling the means and manner of the work, which in most cases is the host employer. Next slide. Thank you. Great, thanks Mike um, for providing that overview of the document. Um, we're gonna briefly share with you the dissemination strategy that we've been rolling out for this document. Um, but I just wanted to briefly mention, I know Mike just shared a lot uh, a lot of information with you. Um, and again, that was just a sample of the um, recommended practices that are included in the document. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, we will have some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, we just have a couple more slides. Um, and you can either put your questions in the Q&A box and we can uh, respond to those. Or after the presentation, you can raise your hand and we can um, give you permission to come off of mute and you can ask your question um, that way as well. So the Contingent Workers Workgroup has started implementing a pretty ambitious dissemination plan for this document, including the following. And we have put the completed or in process dissemination activities in bold on this slide. Um, so first we've conducted an email campaign through which we sent the document to a list of over 200 individuals and organizations. And along with these emails, we included a dissemination toolkit which includes a draft email, a flyer, and draft social media messages and images that can help others uh, disseminate, help us disseminate the document. We've also linked to the document on some of our partner websites, um, such as the American Staffing Association Safety Matters page, as well as the OSHA Temporary Worker Initiative page, uh, among others. We also put out a NIOSH update, also known as a press release. Um, this went out on July 18th, and the co-branding partners have also put out or plan to put out their own press releases. The NIOSH director, Dr. John Howard, published a From the Director's Desk article about the document in the August issue of NIOSH eNews. And we're also planning to publish a NIOSH science blog in the near future. During the first half of August, there were 13 posts on NIOSH social media outlets, including the NIOSH Facebook page, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram uh, pages. Uh, another piece of dissemination that's important to know about is the work group also developed a slide deck that um, is intended for staffing companies to be able to use to educate their host employer clients about the best practices in the document. And this slide deck can be found on the document homepage on the NORA Services Sector Council website. And again, the link to that page is included in the chat for this meeting. We also plan to promote the document at national meetings and conferences through presentations or panel discussions, and also through articles in trade and uh, trade journals and safety publications. 
The partner organizations have also um, put together planned dissemination activities for the document. For instance, the American uh, Society of Safety Professionals or ASSP, uh, I believe is planning to do a podcast about the document. Uh, we've also talked with ASSP about the possibility of creating an ANSI registered technical report based on the document. If you have any suggestions for dissemination activities, please uh, let us know. Um, we, we really want to do our best to, um, to put this information out um, and, and get it out to as many people as we can. So thank you very much for attending this presentation today. We hope that you found it helpful. Um, we really want to thank the members of the Contingent Workers Workgroup and everyone who contributed to the development of this document. You can find a full list of contributors in the background section of the document on pages 14 to 15. Um, but there was really a lot of people who put a, a lot of um, their time and energy and thought into this document, and we, we really want to thank everyone for, for all of that. Just to let you know what's on the horizon, as a next step, the Contingent Workers Workgroup is working to create a similar best practices resource for staffing companies, and we're hoping to publish that sometime next year. Um, we also, as I mentioned, plan on doing a campaign targeting workers, and we're still um, trying to decide what that's going to look like, and we're, we're certainly open to suggestions um, from, from you all if you have any ideas for that. Um, there was a question in the Q&A about whether or not the slides would be available. We are more than happy to send you a PDF of the slides if, if that would be helpful. Um, you can feel free to reach out to, to me for that. My email address is on the uh, screen here. Um, if you go to the Nora Services Sector Council website, there's also an email address um, that you could email there as well. Um, and we are recording today's presentation and we'll be posting the recording on the document homepage um, so that you can um, you know, view again later or share it with, with other people who might be interested. So we do have um, just again for your convenience, a QR code for the document um, in, the, in the slide here. We do have some discussion questions that we wanted to put up. So again, if, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to, um, to raise your hand um, or you can put questions into the Q&A box as well. Any, any questions or comments? Okay, I see a question from Brittany and what's next for the council? And that's a great question that, uh, Mike and I were talking uh, a little bit about just yesterday, um, and uh, I think we're we're probably going to be uh, at some point in the future here, in the near future, uh, putting out a survey to the council members to ask them what they would be interested in doing um, next with the council. Um, as, as some of you may know, we recently have been having some discussions with the uh, NORA Musculoskeletal Health Cross Sector Council about um, doing some kind of collaborative activities with them focused on um, preventing musculoskeletal disorders within the services sector. So we're excited to um, keep that conversation going and, and possibly even form another work group um, focused on, on those issues, which, um, as you may remember, is another objective of the council. Council or of the Nora Services um, agenda. Okay, and then I see another question. Is the document we're referring to the one in the chat? And the answer to that is yes. So the link in the chat will bring you to the document homepage. And on that page, you'll find a link to the document. We also have a standalone um, version of the checklist. So there's checklists related to the best practices that can either be completed electronically or they can be printed um, and completed. And we have a standalone version of those that's also on the document homepage. And then the other resource that you'll find on that page is that slide deck that we mentioned that's intended for staffing companies to educate their um, host employer clients about the best practices but there may be other uh, groups or types of organizations that might find that slide deck useful as well. 
Okay, I see another question that just came in. Um, will we get a copy of the document? Um, so uh, again, the the link to the document homepage is in the chat. Um, we're not printing hard copies of the document uh, at this time, um, but if uh, if if you need the document um, as a hard copy, you can contact me and, and we could maybe look into doing uh, to getting some printed. <clears throat> Another question that came in is, can this document be used by OSHA to cite and find companies via the general duty clause? Um, Kiana, I see that you would like to answer the question live. Hi, Lauren, that's for you to answer live. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure what that yeah. meant. Okay. Um, yeah, so these are just a, a set of recommended best practices. They are not, um, you know, a, a law or um, a, anything that can be um, used to cite and find companies. Mike, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add on that. No, the intent the intent of this document was to, to go beyond compliance, um, as it says, and um, it is not the basis for could be used for the as a basis for citing any company. Uh, for that, there it just you must rely either on the OSHA on direct OSHA um, general duty, or if it's if the state has specific uh, regulations for temporary staffing companies, um, there are one or two states which do now. Uh, then you you have to be be referred referring to that. This is this does not address those. This goes beyond. Generally, this is going. To, this is the intent of this is to go well beyond basic compliance. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And then I'll just also elaborate a little bit or piggyback off of that. And um, just uh, for those who are not familiar, which a, a lot of people are not, um, the difference between NIOSH and OSHA, which might have been a helpful slide for me to include at the beginning, but. OSHA is under the Department of Labor, and they are the ones who are really focused on creating legislation and enforcing legislation related to workplace health and safety. NIOSH is a completely separate part of the government. We're actually under the Department of Health and Human Services. We're an institute of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC. And our mission is really to conduct research and develop different kinds of programs and resources related to workplace health and safety. Um, while we hope that some of the research we conduct does inform uh, laws that end up getting created, NIOSH is not uh, at all involved in, in developing legislation or enforcing legislation. So NIOSH and OSHA really do have very separate roles uh, to play, um, but at the same time, we do you know, work with one another um, quite often. Right. Are there any other questions? Does anybody have their hand up? Um, I see a question that just came in. Um, are any sectors looking at work from home best practices for employers and employees that work from home? And I think that that's a, a great question. Um, I am not aware of any sector of the sector programs at NIOSH that are uh, specifically looking at that, but that is a topic that we've been talking about with the Musculoskeletal Health Cross-Sector Council um, as something that we might try to do some something around um, as a collaborative activity between our two councils, looking at uh, musculoskeletal issues and, and best practices for people who um, are working from home to avoid having uh, musculoskeletal um, issues down the road. But that's a great question. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Mike, do you have any any closing thoughts or anything else you wanted to say? Um, I'm not really. Um, just uh, be on the lookout for the for the social media messages that will that will be following. Um, and uh, it would be great if. If uh, those of you uh, who are coming, who are representatives of staffing companies, 
um, can help uh, disseminate these to potentially your to your prospective clients or or current clients. That would be that would be a great help. Absolutely, yeah. And and on that note, um, we we also would love to hear if if any of you do find this resource to be useful and um, you know, find it to be something that your host employer clients use or um, find beneficial. We would love to hear any um, stories that you might be able to share with us of, of how this document has been useful. Uh, we also would love to hear any suggestions that you have, again, for how we can disseminate this resource, but also things that we um, you know, might be able to develop moving forward that can um, further help support safety and health for temporary workers. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll, we'll be working on a similar set of best practices for staffing companies, and we'll be excited to um, share that with all of you uh, as soon as it's ready. So I'll just, uh, before we close, I'll just go back one slide uh, in case you wanted to get my email address or Mike's email address, um, please feel free to follow up with us with, with any questions or any um, suggestions that you might have. Um, I'll also just throw out there uh, really quickly before we close that the, the Services Council is always open to new members. Um, it's really open to anyone who has an interest in workplace health and safety for uh, service workers. So if anyone is interested in learning more about the Council um, or joining the Council, um, please just shoot me an email and I'd be happy to talk more with you about that. Okay, I see one more question. Oh, um, Kiana asked if we could publish the slides. Uh, I think that we should be able to publish the slides on the, the document homepage. Um, as I mentioned, we are gonna put a link to this recording up on the, the homepage um, and we'll go ahead and put a PDF on the, of the slides on the um, document homepage as well. Okay. Well, unless anyone else has any last questions, we'll we'll go ahead and, and let everyone get to your uh, Tuesday. And um, just thank you again for joining us today. We hope that you um, found the presentation useful, and we hope that the uh, that the document is useful for you as well.